guys, this is Nurse J, and this is my third video of the day, so this must be called the Trinity Series. But anyway, we are going to dive right on in. It might take just a little bit of time, but we're going to discuss um, Yahweh and El. Are they the same gods? The other day, I did a video about Yahweh being the Canaanite god. As I told you before, that uh, Yahweh was a son of El. Okay, you can look in the, in the Canaanite pantheon. El had 70 sons. So, the Israelites were in Canaan. Um, basically, they were the Canaanites. But anyway, you can find this information on Wikipedia. Um, basically, these Israelites um, started worshiping this Yahweh as the creator god of the cosmos. I believe in the sixth century um, while they were in the exile of Babylon or shortly after that. So anyway, let's dive right on into this information. So we're going to be talking about the contradictions in the Bible. Was El and Yahweh the same or different gods? So this is going to be a quick read and we're going to go to the biblical scriptures. So the recent archaeology, biblical, and extra-biblical research has led scholars working in the area of the origins of Israelite religion to assert rather boldly and confidently that the original God of Israel was in fact the Canaanite deity of El. Just exactly how has this come about, you may ask. First, the name Israel is not a Yahwistic name. El, at the end of the word, is the name of the deity invoked in the name of Israel, which translate may El preserve. This suggests that El was seen as a chief god in the formative years of Israel's religious practices. In fact, the story explaining the origin of the name Israel occurs in Genesis 35, verses 9 through 15, where Jacob obtains this name through the blessing of El Shaddai, that is L of the mountain. Secondly, there exist numerous parallels and similarities between descriptions and cultic terminology used for L in the Canaanite text and those used for Yahweh in the biblical sources. At some point, it is ascertained the cultic worship of Yahweh must absorb that of L, though which means Yahweh assimilated in both the imagery and epithet once used of El. So finally, there is strong confirmation of this assimilated in the Bible record itself. In the oldest literary traditions of the Pentateuch, which is the five books of Moses, even though we know there's not a Moses, it is El who regularly appears and not Yahweh, or Yahweh is El. The patriarchal narratives identify El as a deity to whom many of the early patriarchal shrines and altars were built. For example, we are informed in Genesis 30, 30 20 that Jacob builds an altar in the old cultic center of the north, Shechem, and dedicates it to El, God of Israel. Now, if I'm not mistaking, now, I have to go back and look, but I'm thinking that I might be right. Shechem is in the Samaria. I believe it is in the Northern Kingdom. No, or Southern Kingdom. I, I don't know. I have to go back and research that one, but I think it has to do with Samaria. Because to this day, Mark Ger uh, Mount Gerzim um, and the leftover uh, Samaritans are saying that what they received was the true deal of God, not the the Jews in, in this made-up state, what their deal is. Anyway, you have to look on that. So, that El was the deity worshipped at Shechem is also attested in Judges 9, 46, which speaks of the shrine of El, of the covenant. And that the God of the shrine at Bethel which literally translate the house of El is additionally El. I am El of Bethel. Genesis 
31, 13, and 35, 7. And appears to Jacob as El Shaddai in Genesis 35, 11 and 48, 3. And Jacob has another encounter with El at Penuel, which is actually your pineal gland, which is so named because Jacob sees El face to face in 32, 31. And he's seen God face to face, the pineal, the pineal gland. How can you fight God in the physical fleshly form and him not win? You mean to tell me that God has to wrestle with you all night? And even if it is a demigod or an Anunnaki god, <laughs> you have no chance. And El Shaddai, and likewise, Jacob blesses Joseph by El of your fathers. Are you kidding me? Genesis 49, 25. You mean to tell me El of your fathers? Um, hmm, where's Yahweh in the mix? El who sees is given as the etymology of, Abir Lahat Roy in Genesis 16, 13, and we are informed that Abraham journeys to the old cultic shrine at Beersheba, where he plants and worships a tree and calls on the name of El, the Eternal. And at the same time, Yahweh in Genesis 21, 33, contrary to Genesis 33, 20, where the Shechemite El is presented unambiguously as the God of Israel in Genesis 21, 33, and El is apparently already assimilated to Yahweh. Finally, in Genesis 14, 18 through 22, speaks of El, the Most High, of whom the Canaanite Melchizedek is priest at Jerusalem. You see, if Jerusalem is in Canaan, it's a Canaanite. And if Melchizedek is the priest of the God Most High, he is a priest of El. So forget this shit about Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek. That's just some made up shit that they pulled from the Old Testament for the New Testament. We have to wake up and get out of this cognitive dissonance right, to where we have so much proof, and we bring it to you, but because you've been brainwashed so long, just like I have been, I'm not anymore, you can bring all this evidence, you still keep denying it, and it's hurtful, and you can't see through it, but I promise you, if you stick with me, and you email me, you want to, you know, text me or whatever, I'll get you through it, okay, it's painful at first, you sick to your stomach, you can't sleep, and you're wondering who's going to save you. It's a hard process, but I, I assure you, you will get through it. And then you'll laugh when you see all the, the delusions that we've been in. Now, the assimilation between Yahweh and El, or El into Yahweh, is present in much of the priestly material as well. So, in fact, the priestly source largely advocates this assimilation, like Genesis 17, 1, where the priestly scribe states that Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, in Exodus 6, 2, and 3, in contradiction to the J source, has Yahweh assert, I am Yahweh, and I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob, as El Shaddai. And I was not known to them by the name Yahweh. Although the verse suggests an identification between Yahweh and El of the mountain, the verse was subtly recognized an ancient distinction between the God of the patriarchs, El, and the God of the Mosaic era, Yahweh. But the assimilation is clear here. The patriarchs who worshipped El in the past were actually worshipping Yahweh, claims the priestly writer. 
So our knowledge of L predominantly comes from an invaluable corpus of tablets discovered in 1929 in the ancient city of Ugarit. And it is a, it's in the, located in the northern coast of Syria in the modern day Rosh Hashanah. And you can find these tablets on the internet and they have been translated. And this shook the Christian world just like the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Qumran Caves. The Ugarit tablets are the best available witnesses to Canaanite religion and the religious practices and thus also to the background from which the religion of Israel emerged to the Canaanite beliefs and it is shared and adopted. The Ugaritic literature depicts El as the sovereign deity of the Canaanite pantheon. He is frequently referred to the father of the gods, the eternal king, creator of all living beings, and El's other epithets include El the kind, the compassionate, the bull, the ageless one, and the father of years, or you can say the ancient of days. He is depicted as bearded, resides in a tent or a tabernacle, whose throne rests upon a cherubim, and he is the God of blessings and covenants. Many of these epithets and images later became assimilated to Yahweh. For example, Yahweh is often depicted as bearded, king of the gods, compassionate, residing in a tent, and rest on a cherubim. There are, in addition to this, numerous L epithets in various strains of biblical traditions. Epithets that, though a process of assimilation and adoption, later become associated with Yahweh. We have already encountered El Shaddai, El of the Mountain, like Yahweh, who was associated with the Mountain of Sinai, and later in eschatology traditions with Zion. So too, El resides in a mountain. And other patriarchal narratives attest the use of El Olam, or El the Eternal, to whom Abraham plants and worships a tree at Beersheba, El Elyon, El the Most High, and the God of Melchizedek, Genesis 14, 18 through 24. And El Roy means El who sees, Genesis 16, 13. These various El of attempts and associated with different shrines, El Shaddai with Bethel, El the Most High, the creator of the heavens and the earth with Jerusalem, and the El the Eternal with Beersheba, and El who sees with Bir Loharoi, and the El the God of Israel with Shechem. And many of these shrines and altars to El were established by the patriarchs themselves. Examples, Genesis 21, 33, 28, 18, 33, 20, and 35, 14. It has also been suggested that the name Yahweh might have originally been a culted epithet of El. The etymology of Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, is still unclear, but one proposal is to see it as the causative imperfect of the Canaanite Proto-Hebrew verb H-W-Y to be. It is probable, therefore, as many commentators have contended, that the early Israelites actually worshipped El through the epithet Yahweh. This process of assimilation is usually presented the other way around in the biblical literature. Yahweh is worshipped through the epithets of El Shaddai, Olam, and, El and Elon, Contrary to these biblical traditions that suggest an assimilation between Yahweh and El, there are other passages that seem to indicate that Yahweh was a separate and independent deity within El's council. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 is one of the rare passages that seemingly preserves a vestige of an earlier period in proto-Israelite religion where El and Yahweh were still depicted as separate deities. So let's go there, 32, eight and nine. Go to the book. All right, Deuteronomy 32, 
verse 8 and 9. Oh, here we go. Verse 8. When the Most High, which would be El, El Yon, El, divided to the nations their inheritance. When he separated the sons of mankind, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Verse 9, for the Lord's portion is his people and Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. See, these Anunnaki gods, all in the Bible. See, the first, there's two points to take away from this passage that I just read to you guys. First, the passage presents an apparently older mythic theme that describes when the divine beings, that is, each deity in the divine council, were assigned and allotted their own nation. Israel was the nation that Yahweh received. Secondly, Yahweh received his divine portion, and Israel, through an action initiated by the god El, here identifiable through his epithet, the Most High. In other words, the passion depicts two gods. El and Yahweh. One, the Most High El is seen as assigning the nations to the divine beings or gods in his council, and the other Yahweh is depicting as receiving from the first God, the Most High, his particular allotment, namely the people of Israel. And if you go to Numbers 21, 29, the God Shamash is assigned to the people of Moab. Utu Shamash, the Babylonian god, another one of those Anunnaki gods. Now, another biblical passage reaffirmed the archaic view of Yahweh as a god in El's council. In Psalm 82.1, it speaks of the assembly of El. Okay, and Psalms 29.1 enjoins the sons of El to worship Yahweh. And Psalms 89, 6, and 7 list Yahweh amongst El's divine counsel. So let's go to Psalms 82, 1. But this is a monotheistic Bible. Okay. Okay. Okay, here we go, guys. So, the Elohim, which is plural for God's, Standeth in the congregation of the mighty, and he judgeth amongst the gods. Plural. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of El Elyon, of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O Elohims, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. We have a divine council of the Elohim, and the main God is telling the little G's to get with the program, or they're going to die just like men. Now, let's go to Psalms 29.1. 29, 1. 29 1 says, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name, or worship the Lord in his beauty and holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters, and the God of glory Thundereth the Lord is upon many waters. So this means to worship Yahweh. So let's go back to 89, Psalms 89, 6 and 7. Psalms 89, 6 and 7. Eighty-nine six says, For who in heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? Elohim is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints 
and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee. So basically giving all of their stuff now to Yahweh. The process of assimilation even morphed into the meaning of the name El, which later became to mean just simply God. Because Elohim really means plural. Gods or goddesses, divine judges, um, supreme beings. That's going to be your Anunnaki. So that Yahweh was directly identified as El. Thus, Joshua twenty two twenty two, the God of gods is Yahweh. So, in Joshua, it's already saying that there's more than one God. Okay? So, noteworthy also is the fact that unlike the God Baal, there is no polemic in the Bible against El. And all the old cultic centers of El, like those in Jerusalem, Shechem, Beersheba, were later accredited to Yahweh. Since a large majority... Of patriarchal narratives that speak of shrines and altars to El are found in the northern kingdom, such as Bethel, Shechem, and on the other hand, many biblical texts seem to credit Yahweh's origin to the southern Negev. The current scholarly hypo, hypo, excuse me, um, hypothesis, there we go, is that the worship of El in the north and of Yahweh in the south, they merge together. Okay, I guess they found a common ground. So these thesis finds further support in the incident of Jeroboam, who may have acted to reestablish the cult of Yahweh El at Dan and Bethel via his golden bulls. In the sum, the biblical literature, spanning as it does hundreds of centuries in culture and cultic traditions, preserve divergent views, portraits, theologies, and origins of his God Yahweh. So... So now that I've kind of gave you a backdrop of El and Yahweh, both being Canaanite gods, and I gave you scriptures upon scriptures upon scriptures to show you how it was El first, and they adopted Yahweh, put Yahweh in El, so they usurped, they used Yahweh, they usurped El to make their god of the creator cosmos and took it away from El. So it sounds like a little family drama going on. So now we gotta find out, is El really Inky Pata? I doubt it because Inky was the god of Egypt and he was called Pata, the supreme creator god in Egypt. See Pata, Inky, he didn't have any jurisdiction in Iraq, Mesopotamia area. That was his brother Enlil and his clan and his crew. And Marduk was always pissed off and was always fighting and battling the Nurta, Nergal. And, you know, it was just a battle. Okay? So, Pata Inki is sole owner of Egypt. So, I hope you learned a little bit today, guys. Please like, share, and subscribe. Please give me comments. I like to talk with people, I like to share ideas. Um, you know, people don't understand that the very first tablets were the Sumerian tablets, um, gives us all of our history, basically. Um, the Arata people were, um, prior to the Sumerians, um, like Gobekli Tepe, um, and the only reason why we know that the Arata people were in existence, uh, through writing is the Epic of Gilgamesh talks about that the Arata people were Gilgamesh's ancestors. Um, so anyway, they left us nothing. So now we got to go to the Sumerians, Egyptians, Babylonians, Assyrians, Phoenician Canaanites, and all down the line. So anyway, hope you enjoyed this video, and I will get back to you soon. Hotep, Ashe, and have a great evening. Bye, guys.